The Persona series is known for its compelling and thematic storytelling. This is often as a result of the writer's effective use of a variety of literary devices. One of the most significant of these devices is intertextuality. This term was coined by Julia Kristeva in 1966, and is used in literary theory to denote and define the interdependence that exists between texts of different kinds. This does not merely refer to texts quoting one another, or alluding to existing themes or tropes, but rather to the discourse that is created between texts as they echo one another across time and space. In Persona 3, we see the use and reuse of the notion of memento mori, a philosophical concept that dates back to classical antiquity. On the other hand, in Persona 4, we see Japanese mythology used extensively. In both games, these intertextual choices reinforce the thematic elements of their respective stories. Persona 5 shares this trend of intertextuality with its predecessors. In this video, I hope to demonstrate how Persona 5 uses intertextuality to great effect. I will focus on intertextual elements that relate to the game's narrative, mechanics, and worldbuilding. Have you ever noticed that all of the DLC personas in the game have two variants, one of which is always called a Picaro? Well, the picaresque novel is a genre of fiction that typically depicts the adventures of a roguelike but appealing hero as he upwards corrupt society. This genre had its origins in 16th century Spain and remained a popular mainstay of European fiction for another 200 or so years. The picaresque novel is defined by its hero, the Picaro, his or her wits or natural abilities in the face of corruption, challenge or change. The Picaro is an outcast on the fringes of society and displays trickster-like behaviour stopping just short of true criminality. Although this is a genre of fiction, picaresque figures have existed in collective history and folklore for centuries. Persona 5 certainly makes intertextual references to a variety of these figures. Perhaps one of the most well-known of these for Western audiences is Robin Hood, the legendary outlaw of English folklore known for his partisanship of the lower classes. Of course, Robin Hood is one of Akechi's personas in the game. Yusuke's persona is based on Ishikawa Goemon, a similar outlaw of Japanese mythology. Ryuji's persona is based on William Kidd, an arguably picaresque historical individual who was tried and executed for piracy in the early 18th century. Zoro, Morgana's persona, is based on the fictional vigilante of the same name, who defends the lower classes from corrupt officials. The characterization of the Picaro is closely related to the archetype of the gentleman thief, which gained popularity in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. A gentleman thief is one characterized by charm and the avoidance of physical intimidation, stealing only to correct a moral wrong or from the very wealthy. This kind of thief shares many of the characteristics of the Picaro, but is usually portrayed as of a higher class with inherited wealth. Perhaps the most well-known gentleman thief in Western literature is Maurice Leblanc's character Arsène Lupin. He was often portrayed as a force of good on the wrong side of the law, defeating villains of degenerate and immoral character. Of course, Arsène is Joker's persona, another example of the use of a literary figure in the game. This intertextual use of the picaresque alter egos of our protagonists is incredibly effective in reinforcing the ways in which they are outcasts treading a fine line between lawfulness and unlawfulness. This is a kind of direct quotation, wherein we interpret a characterization based on our existing knowledge of literature, mythology, and history. After all, the characterization of the Picaro and the Gentleman Thief is almost entirely replicated in the characterization of the protagonist of Persona 5. He is an outcast, falsely accused of a crime he did not commit, and acts on the wrong side of the law to correct moral wrongs. This picaresque intertextuality moves beyond mere characterization and is at the core of the narrative structure of the game's story. Most picaresque works are narrated from a pseudo-confessional perspective, wherein the picaro recounts his adventures in the past leading up to his circumstances in the present. In this way, there are two temporal planes existing within the narrative, a plane of narration in the present and a plane of action in the past. This can be referred to as narrative distance, and it has the effect of creating a certain discourse as the present self reflects on past actions. Indeed, as Ulrich Wicks puts it, in picaresque fiction, the narrative act is an attempt to integrate and make moral and aesthetic sense of disordered past. Notions of morality are at the core of the picaresque structure, and so as readers we become involved in the moral discourse of the plane of narration. Of course, this is the exact narrative structure of the first two thirds of Persona 5's story, wherein our protagonist recounts past events to Sai during his interrogation. Moral questions are frequently posed around the actions of the Phantom Thieves, 
And as we are acutely aware that we are witnessing past events, we are left questioning what moral wrongdoing, if any, led to our protagonist's capture and arrest. This is emphasized by the ways in which he reshapes such events in the plane of narration. By the time the two temporal planes converge, we as the players have come to form our own opinions on the Phantom Thieves and the morality of their justice. The picaresque structure is not the only narrative structure Persona 5 borrows from. It is juxtaposed by intertextual elements from detective fiction. Indeed, Goro Akechi is based upon Kogoro Akechi, a fictional private detective created by Japanese author Edogoro Rampo in 1925. Kogoro is thought to be inspired by Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, a form of intertextuality in and of itself. Much like his Western counterpart, he's known for his genius, brilliance, and eccentricity. He is also considered a master of disguise, which is particularly apt in Persona 5's iteration of Akechi, wherein he, too, disguises his true identity. This act of disguise is emphasized through a second intertextual reference. Akechi's true persona, Loki, is a shapeshifting god of Norse mythology. Once again, however, this intertextuality moves beyond characterization and inter-narrative structure. The detective novel hinges on two separate planes, one for the investigation and the other for the crime. Usually, the crime is concealed from the reader and reconstructed through the investigation. The reader remains puzzled by the mystery until it is solved by the detective in question. Of course, Persona 5 relies on the structure in the mystery of the psychotic breakdowns and mental shutdowns. Sai Nijima and Akechi are framed as detectives who are slowly uncovering the mystery of these events, along with the Phantom Thief incidents. However, this detective structure is then totally inverted when Akechi is revealed as the perpetrator of the crimes and not the detective he claims to be. He is almost an extreme version of the Picaro, a criminal and trickster who uses his unique and brilliant talents in pursuit of villainous acts. In this way, he is also the foil to the protagonist and the Phantom Thieves as a whole. There are already some great analyses on Akechi's role as the foil, so I'll link some videos in the description box down below. Many have also pointed out the potential intertextuality between Persona 5 and Death Note, as both use a similar inversion of the tropes of detective fiction, and both deal with moral questions of justice. When I first played Persona 5, I immediately thought of Akechi and Joker as new iterations of Earl and Kira, as their dynamic is incredibly similar at first. I now see Akechi in particular as possessing qualities of both Earl and Kira in different ways. There may not be any direct quotation from Death Note, apart from perhaps Akechi looking a hell of a lot like Light Yagami, but it is undeniable that these two stories share many similarities. Another narrative element that warrants mentioning is the intertextual use of elements of religion. In the game, each palace ruler represents one of Christianity's seven deadly sins taken to extremes, including a couple of archaic sins. Seven modern sins include Kamoshida's lust, Kanashiro's greed, Futaba's wrath, Okumura's gluttony, Sai's envy, and Shido's pride. Matarame and Maraki are the exceptions to this, with the former representing the archaic sin of vanity or vainglory, and the latter representing the archaic sin of sorrow or despondency. It could be argued that the sin of sloth, the only modern sin without a palace ruler, is the sin of the penultimate dungeon of the game, the Depths of Mementos. It is also assumed by many that Kechi's arc is tied to the archaic sin of Acedia, a state of apathy and listlessness. The use of these sins emphasizes the theme of corruption at the core of the game's story, and perhaps more significantly, how an individual's psyche can become distorted due to excess. As well as this, Yaldabaoth, a malevolent god of Gnostic origin, is the final boss of the vanilla game. The final boss of the re-release of the game, Adam Cadmon, also draws from Judeo-Christianity as a figure that represents the essence of the primordial man, demonstrating Maruki's desire to rework the world. Whether these religious elements provide some meta-commentary on discourses of religion and control is certainly up for debate, especially considering that Joker's awakened persona is Satanile, a literal embodiment of the devil. Let's switch gears for a bit and talk about Maruki. His entire arc seems to draw from Lovecraftian horror in its emphasis on despair at the human condition and general misanthropy. If the tentacles didn't give away the Lovecraftian influence immediately, we eventually find out that Maruki's persona is Azathoth, a deity of Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos seen as a symbol of primordial chaos. It's not just his persona though. Maruki has traits similar to the detached yet scholarly heroes of Lovecraftian literature. 
he despairs at humanity's unhappiness, to the extent that he endeavours to change it. His abilities are incomprehensible and godlike, beyond anything that our protagonists have seen thus far, much like the various Lovecraftian deities, including Azathoth, of course. These are fairly light intertextual influences, but I think that they contribute to the overall tone and message of the third semester. Since we just finished up the section on our resident counsellor, Dr. Maraki, let's take a look at Persona 5's use of psychology. Perhaps the most obvious example of intertextuality in every Persona game is the use of Jungian psychology. The Jungian model of the psyche consists of a few major elements. Of most significance in this context is the shadow, the persona, and particularly in Persona 5, the collective and personal unconscious. According to Jung, the persona is the public part of the self that we portray to those around us as we adapt to various social situations accordingly. It is regarded as the way that we present ourselves to the world. The persona acts to conceal and contain our most primitive impulses and emotions. This is why, in the game, those with personas cannot have shadows. The shadow is the part of the self that is composed of repressed desires, emotions, and weaknesses. These two Jungian concepts act as the foundation of the battle mechanics of the game, wherein our protagonists use their personas to defeat shadows. Of course, they also hold story and world-building significance, particularly through the symbolism of characters' personas, as well as the palaces being ruled by shadow versions of the Phantom Thieves' targets. Furthermore, Persona 5 makes use of Jung's concept of the collective unconscious. In Jung's theory, the collective unconscious refers to how structures of the deepest unconscious mind are shared among beings of the same species. Of course, Persona 5 presents us with mementos, a physical manifestation of this. In many ways, palaces are then the manifestation of Jung's concept of the personal unconscious, which contains anything that is not presently conscious but can be. Much like Personas and Shadows, this not only has implications in terms of game mechanics, but also in terms of story. For example, Mementos is closely tied to the final arc of the vanilla game, as well as Maraki's arc in Royal. The social simulation aspects of Persona 5 also contain their own unique intertextual mechanics, most notably through the use of tarot cards in the major arcana. This has world-building significance, as the main character is always assigned the full arcana, the number zero with infinite possibilities, carefree and spontaneous. The fool's journey is considered a metaphor for one's journey through life, with each major arcana encountered by the fool representing a certain stage of that journey. Persona takes this metaphor literally, as the main character forms bonds with others assigned the remaining arcana. While the arcana are fundamental to the mechanics of persona fusion that one encounters in the Velvet Room, what is more interesting to me is the role they play in the characterization of not only the protagonist as the full, but the rest of the cast too. In fortune telling, each card in the deck is ascribed meaning through an upright and reversed position. More often than not, characters in persona games reflect their arcana in their strengths and weaknesses. This quotation of the arcana is subtle yet effective, as it allows us to interpret characters' actions through a lens of the inevitable dichotomy of the self. After all, in many ways, we have contradictory aspects of ourselves. Since Persona as a series focuses enormously on the psychology of the self, this is an effective intertextual device. I could write an entire essay on the use of the arcana in Persona, but for now I'll use my favourite character in the game, Goro Okechi, as an example. In its upright position, justice represents equity, probity, morality, balance, order, and consequence. However, in its reversed position, it represents duplicity, corruption, chaos, and a lack of accountability. This is the duality of justice, and it is this fine line that Akechi treads throughout his arc. Initially, he is portrayed as a righteous, reasonable individual, until he is revealed as the true culprit and we see his duplicity and corruption. However, when he returns in the third semester, he is fully willing to accept the consequences of his actions and turn himself into the police. Furthermore, he becomes far more self-aware and is willing to sacrifice himself for the restoration of order to the world. He is thus both sides of the Justice Arcana in one way or another. This can be applied to many other characters in the game. Some of the best examples that come to mind are Yuki Mishima, the Moon, Makoto Nijima, the High Priestess, and Futaba Sakura, the Hermit.
The Velvet Room has been a mainstay of the series since its inception, and it too was born from intertextuality. Edgar Allan Poe's 1842 short story, The Mask of the Red Death, follows its protagonist, Prospero, as he navigates his way through seven different rooms of different colours during a bizarre masquerade. Each room is thought to represent a stage of life. This metaphor reminds me a little bit of the aforementioned Fool's journey, with Prospero characterised as dauntless and sagacious, just like the Fool. The final room, considered that which one enters just before death, is known as the Velvet Room. Indeed, Prospero meets his own death in this room, just as the player always sees the Velvet Room upon a game over. This is even more significant when considering that the Velvet Room is described as a place between mind and matter, dream and reality. In Poe's story, the masquerade seems realistic at first, but by the time Prospero reaches the Velvet Room, it is surreal, eerie and dreamlike, indicating its proximity to the afterlife. Another reference to the Mask of the Red Death can be found in the song Beneath the Mask, where the lyrics make direct reference to Poe's masquerade. The nature of the masquerade, which, in the story, is framed as a place where the elite are holed up to avoid a plague, is also thematically relevant to Persona 5, as we see the elite plagued by corruption. Shido's palace in particular is framed as a masquerade of the deceitful and amoral elite of Japan. There are certainly many different interpretations of the game's intertextuality with the story, so let me know what you think. This short literary analysis likely barely scratched the surface of the nuances of the intertextual elements in Persona 5. The game is vast and overwhelming in its attention to detail, and there are certainly elements that I have left out for a lack of time, such as the hundreds of personas available to the protagonist that are based on a variety of historical, literary and mythological figures, or little things like this. To paraphrase Hegel, advancement cannot occur without both thesis and antithesis. However, I do hope that this essay will add to the discourse created by such immense intertextuality. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching. This was a fun project to work on, and it felt really good to use what I learned at university in this context. I do plan to make more video essays in the future, so if you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe.